Welcome to another edition of Eye on the Issues, and today we are talking about climate change, and I'm talking to Gregory Wrightstone. He is the executive director of what's called the CO2 Coalition. Sir, thank you for joining me today. Let's begin by talking about what is the CO2 Coalition? Oh, yes. it's We're the preeminent scientific organization in the world of climate skeptics, those that don't believe that there's a climate crisis and our overlying theme is that we believe that more CO2 is hugely beneficial to not only our ecosystems, but to, to benefits the human condition. Uh, and we can talk more about that as we go through. Uh, but we've got more than 150, including we just, for example, recently added Dr. John Clauser to our board of directors. And you may not know that name, but he was the 2022 Nobel laureate in physics. and. Uh, I'll just tell a little short story about John. He was honored at the White House, uh, and afterwards he shook Joe Biden's hand and he said, uh, "Sir," he says uh, respectfully, uh, "the science you're using to base your energy and climate change policies on is just wrong." Uh, Joe got angry and he said, "You're just spouting right wing science." So Joe Biden was lecturing the Nobel laureate in physics, not science. Uh, and so we get called climate deniers all the time, but we are eminent scientists. And it's hard to call uh, John Clauser a climate denier when he's holding a, he's a Nobel laureate in physics. That's incredible. So we're going to uh, focus a little bit on, on, on Wyoming in a minute, but let's begin at the 10,000 feet level and talk about your your science and what you've gathered during your research to let you believe that what many people around this world are saying is climate change and a problem. Why is it not? Well, uh, by almost every metric you look at, Earth's ecosystems are thriving and prospering and benefiting. Uh, it's by any, any rational look at this, it tells you that. We, we know that, that uh, we're actually in CO2 famine. Uh, our CO2 levels today are at near historically low levels. They're not too high, they're too low. Uh, plants benefit more from more CO2 and we're still being uh, in plant growth to uh, benefit from much higher levels of carbon dioxide. We'll get more into that in a little bit. Uh, but we see, if you, just, if you look at the science of facts and the data, you'll find that fires globally are declining. Hurricanes are not increasing. Tornadoes are actually in a decline. Uh, severe weather events uh, and fatalities, particularly, have been a, a, an incredible decline over the last 120 years. Um, sea levels rising at seven inches per century, which doesn't sound uh, too drastic to me. And um, and we, we are in a warming trend, but it started warming more than 300 years ago, long before we started adding carbon dioxide. Um, but just the, the science, the facts, and the data support this idea of a of an ecosystem that's thriving, improving, vegetation's exploding from the near polar regions to the equator, and it's because of more CO2 and warming, but mostly more CO2. You know, in, in journalism, we say it's a story. The story is not dog bites man. The story is when the, the man bites the dog. So what we're saying right now and what you're saying is, is something that's a lot of it's in many ways opposite of what so many people around the globe are saying right now. And, and it's almost like what you're saying, in my estimation, as a journalist needs to be on the front page. Why are are, are you getting any traction with what you're saying and, and, and it, what can be done to to get more traction? Yeah, I call it the greatest untold story of the 21st century, that of a thriving planet, a thriving humanity uh, that flies in the face of what you're talking about. And as we go through this, we we show the science of what's actually happening, and we need to be silenced. And they're silencing us significantly because we make a lot of sense, and we have the science to back us up for what we're saying. We just do. And because of that, we need to be silenced. If they're going to continue hoisting this false climate crisis narrative 
on not just the American public, but the, the global public. Um, people like us, like John Clauser, like our, our chairman, Dr. Will Happer, uh, Meredith's uh, physics professor from Princeton, eminent physicist, uh, they need to they need to silence us. Um, when if if we get our message out in the general public, it's game over for the climate crisis. Uh, it just is, as we're we can we can dispute it, uh, fact after fact, science, scientific uh, data after scientific data to show that it, there is no climate crisis and sure. the Earth, Earth and humanity are, are hugely prospering. So let's let, let's begin by drilling down this way, if you don't mind, Greg. Let's talk about the three biggest claims of the other side, and then your rebuttal for those. Could could you hand that, give us three, and then rebut three? Well, we already talked a little bit. The biggest one is is obviously that CO two's um, at excessively high levels, and that it's uh, it's leading to unusual and unprecedented warming. And the fact of the matter is, we're at 420 parts per million today. And that's, yes, it's it's increased since the Industrial Revolution. We were at 280, 420s, 50% increase. Uh, so there, yes, we've increased CO2 to uh, 50%. Uh, but uh, bear in mind, throughout Earth's history, CO2 levels have averaged about 2,600 parts per million, six and a half times what they are today. Life flourished. Uh, ecosystems flourished, and uh, we benefit, and the, the earth and the ecosystem benefit from more CO2. So rather than having too much CO2, we don't have enough. Uh, plants are not at optimum growth potential at these low levels of carbon dioxide. The other is um, our current temperatures are unusual and unprecedented. Uh, that's just false. They are, if you only look back 150 or so years, so we're in a warming trend. Again, it started warming 300 plus years ago. We need to look back as a geologist. I look back through not just hundreds, but thousands and millions of years of data and thousands of data, years of data, particularly back to the end of the last glacial advance. We see that there were nine other warming trends similar to what we are in today. All other nine of those were warmer than it is today. Uh, and life was good during the other warming periods. It wasn't just good, it was great. Food was bountiful, uh, civilizations flourished, great empires arose during these warming periods. It was the cold, the intervening cold periods that were horrific. And so the big story here is warming, if we look through human history and compare it to climate history, we find that the, the warm periods were, were just hugely beneficial. So the contrast here is they're saying, oh, my God, we can't, it's going to get too warm and we're all going to die because there's going to be famine and drought and fire and pestilence and it's going to be awful. History doesn't tell us that. History tells us we should welcome the warmth and fear the cold. There's a cold in each case since the first great civilizations rose up, cold has led to horrific consequences of crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation. This, it's a combination of pretty bad things that went on there, and it was related to the coal. Uh, so, the third the third might be this uh, increase in, in severe weather and, and climate disasters. And it's uh, the, UN, the UN data that I capture in my new book, A Very Convenient Warming, I show that Actually, natural disasters, as reported by the UN, have decreased 10% since the year 2000. Uh, and there's, there, we go through, I go through each one of these, we look at these purported disasters, and we find that fires in the United States are at 20% today, both area burned and number of fires. It might not seem like it, because the media hypes every single fire that comes up. Fires have always been with us. Fires always will be with us. Uh, it's a consequence of of dryness in the in usually in the northern hemisphere in late summer, early fall. Um, and but we know that by looking at the Copernicus. I don't want to go into too much detail, but we we look through this both globally and in the United States and in Canada. We look at the 
that the numbers are actually declining. And we can look at each one of these severe weather events to find that uh, severe weather deaths, for example, have decreased well more than 90% since 1900. Uh, so again, it's, so it's CO2 is not too high, temperatures are not too high, and the severe weather that they're claiming is increasing isn't. So what about the claim that the polar ice caps are melting? Well, there has been, particularly, let's talk about glaciers that are, that are a great example. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth. Antarctica, for sure, the temperature is not declining. And there's a pretty good case we could make for increases in Antarctica. Uh, the northern uh, ice cap is has retreated. It's advanced. It's, re, it's probably less than it was 150 years ago. Uh, but we're, again, we're in a warming period, and that should be expected. Uh, what we can see is if we look at the, for example, North American or Northern Hemisphere glaciers, uh, capture a study of 169 glaciers around the world, and find that the glaciers started melting in the early 1800s. And again, we didn't start adding a lot of CO2 until the mid-20th century. So 150 years before we started adding CO2, the glaciers started retreating. And it, it, we, we can look at it. In the book, I've got a pack picture of my wife and I standing on top of the Mendenhall Glacier outside of Juneau. Um, and 1,000 feet below us, the glacier's retreating. 1,000 feet below us is a mature forest that was growing 1,000 years ago during right. the medieval warm period. Well, heck, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, because I'm not, I'm a geologist, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, you know, it had to have been a lot warmer back then, a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, a thousand years ago, the Vikings were growing barley up on Greenland, where you can't grow barley there now. So I like I like using historical data. Sure. To put the, the temperature perspective. Okay. So now, now let's drill down if we can. Uh, you put a report out recently called Wyoming and Climate Change. Um, and most of our viewers are from Wyoming. So why don't you kind of break it down for us? What, what can people from Wyoming learn from your report? Well, it's it's part of our state and regional series of reports. We've done one on Pennsylvania, Virginia, uh, the Midwest. Uh, and so Wyoming, we were driven to do this Wyoming report when Governor Gordon, a Republican governor, I might add, uh, wants to, to decarbonize the West and start with Wyoming. And he wants to to do carbon capture, uh, to, to drive this dangerous demon gas carbon dioxide, to drive it down. We consider carbon dioxide the miracle molecule. And we said, so we, we were approached by uh, individuals in Wyoming, and we rose to the challenge. Uh, we had our team, we put, put together uh, Dr. Byron Sapoyan uh, and myself and Dr. William Happer of Princeton, and you know, the rest of our team, we, we put this report together to look at what's actually happening in Wyoming. Um, and we use the United States Historical Climate Network data, uh, which are pretty good, pretty well cited sites. There were 17 across Wyoming, spread across the state. And we use their data. So I'm using NOAA, National Oceanographic and Administration data, um, to, to look at what's hap actually happening in Wyoming. And that data starts in 1895, move up to 2023. And so we find that uh, the average temperature for Wyoming has indeed increased about 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit since 1895. But we looked at it a little bit deeper, and we looked at the maximum and the hottest temperatures. And what was fascinating, they've actually been in a 90-year decline. So we're being told, and the people of Wyoming are being told, we have to fear the heat. Heat waves are what's going to, going to be terrible. But we find that they peaked in the 1930s and have been declining ever since. And what's driving the average temperature is not the hot daytime temperatures, but rather nighttime coldest temperatures in Wyoming have increased significantly. So instead of being five degrees Fahrenheit and 12 degrees Fahrenheit, it's still cold, really cold. But it's not as cold. And so that's that's actually hugely beneficial. And, and if you think about it, your nighttime temperatures in terms of agriculture is what drives the length of the growing season. And so because of this, we know that the growing season in Wyoming's lengthened. 
Uh, that means killing frosts end earlier in the spring, arrive later in the fall. We know that the growing season in the continental United States has increased by more than two weeks since 1900. So that's a good thing. Um, and so we looked at both, uh, we looked at the heat the percentage of stations of those 17 that exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's in decline. It's a 90 year decline. Uh, there's another claim that uh, we're going to see the end of snow that the uh, key resorts, uh, you know, we're going to see the end of snow. They're going to go away. So we took a look at eight, eight of the top ski resorts in Wyoming, and we found that uh, five of the eight. So we're actually, what we're doing is we're going back. We're taking the claims. We're actually looking at what the facts tell us. And we found that five of those eight resorts had increasing, in terms of inches per year, increasing snowfall, not decreasing. One was about, one was flat. Two had a slight decline. But it's completely opposite of what we're being told. And we went back through and we said, oh, drought's going to increase. And we see that actually precipitation is modestly increasing, which is a great thing, Particularly, mainly for agriculture, fire suppression, and the, and the like. Uh, it was really empowering. And it's, it's the uh, agriculture production in the state. We see it's exploding and increasing. It's not declining. These are all good things. We found only benefits uh, of this and, and none of the none of the plain crises are actually occurring so people the, the bottom line for the people of wyoming is sleep well there is no climate crisis in wyoming the united states or globally interesting now what goes through your mind when you hear these people talk about the concern about fossil fuels and too much gas and oil and natural gas. Uh, what goes through your mind when you hear people say, we need to use electric cars? Well, we, we know for, for one thing, we know that natural gas and coal are, are extremely reliable. When I look at the, like, we have to talk about the electricity generation and what do we want as a good source for our electric? It should be reliable, it should be abundant, and it should be affordable. Solar and wind are none of those three. It's not reliable, they're not abundant, it's not it's not affordable. It's much more expensive. When, when you go from the from the ground up from the, the very beginning of the process to the end, and also what they don't talk about are the recycling and how how often these, for example, wind turbines need to be replaced. They claim a 25-year life. It's it's more like 15 to 20. So you're going to have to complete, you're going to have to be recycling these things, putting up new ones all the time. Uh, there's there's a growing backlash across the United States against these things. And uh, for example, in my home state, I moved from Pennsylvania to the free state of Florida recently. But in Pennsylvania, we have what's called the, the state game lands. They control 1.2 million acres uh, across the state. And the, a lot of these are these Allegheny Mountain ridges, the Laurel Highlands, where they're, they're very attractive and in high demand for industrial scale wind facilities. And don't you dare call them farms. They're not farms. These are industrial facilities. Um, the state game lands two years ago voted unanimously, all 18 members, to ban in perpetuity any wind facilities on their property. And they, the reason was they said it's contrary to our mission, which is to preserve wildlife to preserve endangered species and keep it, our 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 lands open for our sportsmen to hunt and fish as they wish on those. And so they all 18 members voted unanimously that it was contrary to their their mission statement is is to be eco-friendly and, and provide for the for the people and the animals that, that live there. So let me ask you this. Are you clearly what you're saying makes sense? And and I'm, I'm you know I it's it makes complete it's logical are you get when you when you make your arguments and make your claims are you getting anybody on capitol hill that's willing to listen yeah we've met i'm not i have to be careful i'm not going to mention uh names uh, you don't have to names i mean well i can mention senator barrasso uh, who's he, he's very strong and uh, we, we we were able to sit down and meet and some others that we've met with uh, we've met with uh, some of the house members and we have uh, more coming up we're gonna 
trying to get Dr. John Klaus or hopefully come out here next month to do a, a congressional meeting and possibly testify before the House and tell, you know, he's the Nobel laureate, of course. Uh, and so we're, we're working with that. But our, our main mission is to inform the population of the United States, the people mm -hmm. of Wyoming. And our part of our mission is to arm them with the data that they can then use to talk to their friends and neighbors. And that's what we've done with this Wyoming report. It's it's a, you know, I'm really proud of what we were able to put together. It's it's very readable. And it's it's we're not it's it's not terribly scientific. It, well, it's yes, it's scientific, but it's it's not it's something that the regular Joe and Jane that's not a scientist can understand. We've, we've right. done it that intentionally. And, and it is very, I, I'm going to read one line from it in, in the executive summary, just because I started to go through it and I thought it was very, very down to earth. The research, this research concludes that Wyoming, like the planet, is benefiting from warming that began more than 300 years ago. Efforts to reduce CO2 emissions are unnecessary and exorbitantly expensive and would make no measurable difference in temperature. That says a lot right there. And if people want to read this report, where can they find it? Well, go to our website, which is co2coalition.org. And then in our search bar, just search for Wyoming and you'll find it easily. So co2coalition.org. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we're, we're there for the people of Wyoming. Uh, we want to save Wyoming from itself uh, and for making some really bad economically destructive decisions. You, you know what, this, this, as a reporter, this makes me think back to Y2K um, when I was a reporter in what's called Pocatello, Idaho, not very far from Wyoming, actually. And it was a big bust, if you recall. I do very well. I worked for a company called Stat Oil Energy, uh, owned by the, the Norwegians out of Stavanger, Norway. They were scared to death of Y2K. And uh, they were bound and determined to sell their American uh, company before the stroke of midnight of that year. And uh, they did. It was like two days ahead of time. But they were, they were just, they were terrified. And then it came and went and nothing happened. Right. It was the computers that were not supposedly set up for the year 2000. That was, yeah. the, that was the big fear. Anyhow, but, but a lot of what is being said right now makes me think of that. Like, we're going to spend all this money, do all these things, and it's going to be all for naught. It is. And again, it's, it's so we, you know, when I, I, I'm very optimistic about this, Mike, because when I try, I do, I travel around the country a lot. I just speak to just random people. You know, airports, restaurants, wherever, because I strike up a con. What do you do? And I tell them when we start talking, and I tell them about this information, show them some of the data. People almost every person I talk to, your eyes get wide. And they say, Well, I've never heard that. And people are thirsty, absolutely thirsty for this information that's been hidden from them. Um, and they're being lied to, being lied to about climate change. They relied, you know, I think COVID did a lot to kind of help people they it opened their eyes to understand that wow sometimes the experts that we're being told are experts can be wrong and they can be quite often wrong and so it's kind of loosened up now people are going well they were they were wrong about so much about covid maybe they're wrong about maybe those so-called experts are wrong about this as well mm -hmm. um and you know i've had a lot of people talking about the the conflation of the two, you know, we had a COVID lockdown and now they're actually talking about climate lockdowns and the same, same thing we did for COVID we need to do for, for climate. Uh, and these are serious discussions that are going on about this. It's just crazy. Um, and they, what they want to do, it's about, they want to control almost every aspect of your, your viewers' lives, what you can drive, how you cook your meal on your stove, how you heat your home, how much water comes out of your out of your shower, how much uh, and what dishwasher you can buy. You know, oh, now you're going to have to wash your dishes twice to get them clean because they're low low flow, low water, low heat. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know that's true and people are listening to this shaking their head yeah um and it's i mean i i just bought i'm in an apartment in florida here and my son-in-law visited we put a new shower head in it was just dribbled out with three flow restrictors in that shower head he knocked them out and man the water comes out like niagara falls now and but <laughs> it, their, their intention they don't want me getting a shower that's enjoyable they want it just dribbling out yeah and the, the flow restrictors is because there's a drought in the southwest of the united states right um, it's one size fits all policy for these federal alphabet soup bureaucracies like doe uh department of the department of energy the epa and the others yeah you are exactly right and it comes down to it you nailed it the one word control so yep. Gregory Wrightstone of the CO2 Coalition. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for educating us about what's going on. If folks, if you want to learn more about what's happening around Wyoming, you can go to ywyliberty.org and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs>